What's up, YouTube? We're going to talk essential metal today. Agaloc's second record, The Mantle. This has to be, without a doubt, one of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. And what a joy it was to just have an excuse to stare out the window and listen to this album a bunch of times in preparation for this video. Interestingly enough, though, back when I first heard The Mantle in my mid-teens, it was one of those albums where I had to really sit down and, like, try to get into it. I had to take other people's word on it, kind of, because I didn't really understand it at first. And that's a, honestly, that's a leap of faith that happens a lot as a music fan, especially when you adopt a more exploratory and adventurous and open-minded approach to getting into music, as opposed to just finding your favorite bands and your favorite genres and, like, sticking with them like a, a loyal sports fan. So for those of you who don't know, Agaloc were, and man that hurts to say that, were an extreme metal band out of Portland, Oregon who pumped out a few of the most exceptional records we have seen in the metal genre in these past two decades. In many ways, especially on the mantle, the band defy a, a strict genre categorization, but we'll put them under the, the broad umbrella of black metal because that's still the first thing that pops into my head. And it's probably the genre label where you'd be the, the least wrong. The band's classic second record, The Mantle, came into my life before my hardcore black metal fandom sort of went full throttle. So when I first heard it, it was very different from the super riff-oriented and aggression-oriented thrash metal and death metal that I was all in on at the time. And on top of that, it was also a lot different from the more orthodox black metal records that I was already into, like Satyricon's Nemesis Divina, or Dark Throne's Transylvanian Hunger, or those first early Emperor records, so I really didn't know what to make of it. So a celebration for the death of man is the unassuming intro track that kicks things off with this real doom and gloom acoustic guitar line that's strummed so intimately that it sounds like just one man's solitary depression as he just stares longingly out the window. And as this intro track rolls along, we get these suspense building embellishments, like some strings, some nocturnal sound effects, and these stabs of electric guitars in the background that almost mimic the sound of thunder during a massive storm. In just over two minutes, this song manages to create an atmosphere that's both drama-filled and despairing at the same time. And we then arrive at the first proper track, the 15-minute behemoth in the shadow of our pale companion, which is one of the individual tracks from this iconic album that's really iconic in its own right. Just, oh, where do I even start with this song? Like, right away, there are so many layers to this. Like, the first two minutes and 45 seconds features this very simple, clean guitar line that serves as the backbone of the song. But almost immediately, some strummed acoustic guitars are thrown on top of it, and then there's this harmonized lead acoustic guitar line that sort of floats on top of that. The only way to describe this harmonized guitar lead is just that it's beautifully sad. Like, it has this romanticized melancholy to it that pierces that lonely, anguished part of our psyche, but simultaneously taps into that part of ourselves that makes it all seem like it's going to be okay, that finds a beauty in that suffering. I know that's a, a lot of deep digging over like six notes, but that's the kind of intense impact that this song and this record have on me. So we have this unbelievably layered collage of clean electric guitars, acoustic leads and rhythms, and electric guitars all somehow working in tandem. And then when frontman John Hamm's vocals enter, they're as dichotomous and varied as the music is. In this song, he alternates between these wretched black metal vocals and this grim, clean singing where he reaches real low into his register to match the, the darkness of the music. And there's also some creepy, spoken word, layered vocals elsewhere in the song. And somehow, it all fits. Like, you hardly even notice these drastic changes in vocal styles. Changes that in any other band would warrant a massive shift in tone. But here, there's just this steady, constantly evolving, underlying musical bed that can seemingly accommodate any vocals. <laughs> Next thing we know, someone's gonna make a fucking rap remix of this shit. Well, hopefully not, but you get my point. In the shadow of our pale companion, all 15 minutes of it 
always generates these majestic visuals in my head as I'm listening to it. Like I've, I've hiked to the top of a mountain and I'm gazing over miles and miles of rolling suburban hills, or maybe I'm standing at the foot of an enormous waterfall, or I'm stuck in the middle of a forest during a blizzard with no way out. It's like this, this song, and by extension this album, is like an audio IMAX movie. This song has so much atmosphere to it that at one point, three fucking notes can just repeat over and over and over again for 45 whole seconds, just three notes. And you hardly even notice how little is going on because the layers to this song are so effortlessly peeled off and replaced one by one in this methodical but smoothly flowing manner. It's incredible. Of course, one of the main things that makes In the Shadow of Our Pale Companion stand out and makes this whole album stand out is the fusion of electric and acoustic instrumentation. Before The Mantle, I had never heard this much acoustic instrumentation in extreme metal before. I had, of course, been listening to Opeth for years, but Opeth is a different thing because there's a lot more of church and state between their folky acoustic guitar parts and the death metal stuff, but Agalock was a whole different thing because you're hearing them at the same time. Besides Pale Companion, one of the shining examples of Agalock expertly weaving together acoustic and electric instrumentation is the track I Am The Wooden Doors. If you skip to the 3 minute and 45 second mark, you'll find these harmonized acoustic guitars being thrust into the middle of this full-on black metal attack with marching guitar chords and furious double bass drums, and somehow, Right there in the middle of all that is this delicate acoustic guitar line that commands your attention more than anything that's going on around it. I just don't know how Agalock pulled this off. This abundance of acoustic instrumentation on the mantle is often attributed to the album's overwhelming folk influence. And it's important to acknowledge that while people don't necessarily stick this album in the folk metal category, because that really wouldn't make much sense, it is that folk influence that helps make the mantle so unique. And that ever-present influence reaches its apex on the album's closer, a Desolation song, which features an accordion, a mandolin, and some truly nihilistic lyrics to cap this album off. And while you listen to this album, you can't help but watch this notoriously elitist genre of black metal just expand before your very eyes. And actually, on Agalock's follow-up to the mantle, Ashes Against the Grain, the acoustic stuff would become much more of an accessory to what became a purely atmospheric black metal sound. And Ashes Against the Grain was actually much more immediately enjoyable for me. It actually took like only one listen for me to get into that record. So in a way, Ashes is like the, the ultimate gateway to this band, but I digress. So another one of the many areas in which this album shines is in its lyrical content. And possibly my favorite passage comes from the track, I Am The Wooden Doors. When the heart is a grave filled with blood, and the soul is a cold and haunted shell of lost hope. When the voice of pride has been silenced, and dignity's fires are but cinders, their grandeur shall remain untainted. Again, keeping with the theme uh, of the mantle turning sorrow and moroseness into beauty, like, I've never heard such dark and dismal thoughts put so eloquently as they are in that stanza. And returning for a second to how the lyrics are delivered, aka the vocals, people who don't like extreme metal because of the vocals have zero excuse with this album. Because vocals are so sparsely used. And when they're used, it's not even screaming all the time. And even when there is screaming, there's so much going on underneath it that it's so easy to tune out. And this is what makes Agalock on just that very surface level possibly like the most listenable extreme metal band of all time. Not to mention, the mantle includes four completely instrumental tracks out of nine, so there really, <laughs> there really is no excuse to blame the vocals here. And these instrumentals are every bit as compelling as the other songs on here, the highlight being the Hawthorne Passage, track seven. Tying in my earlier point about the mantle being like an audio IMAX movie, just listen to the Hawthorne Passage and try and picture one of the following. 
You're trudging up a scenic mountain while the sunset burns in the distance. You're taking flight into the night sky. You're struggling through a snowy blizzard and you're not sure whether you're going to make it out alive. <laughs> like, it's, it's the perfect soundtrack to any and all those things. Like, when I listen to this song, it automatically makes me put on that, like, intense, determined face that, like, you see during every movie montage ever. And talk about masterful layering of acoustic and electric guitars on this song. Like, even though the acoustic guitar is, is really in the background and it's so subtle, it's so important to the texture of this song. Like, the entire mood and vibe of this song would collapse without the acoustic guitar sitting back there. And then piano gets worked in seamlessly here, too. Notice also how one very basic musical theme manages to remain interesting for the first five and a half, six minutes of this song. Like, it's just one simple chord progression, yet you never even question or can consider that. It's probably the most impressive thing about this album, that it can do something like that. The Lodge is another instrumental that is basically predicated on a very bare musical premise. It's essentially two chords to the whole song, and it's never boring. And yes, the most epic part of the Hawthorne Passage has to be the climax of what I call Act 2 of the song. You have clean guitars just setting it up for a minute, and then everything at once just bursts back in at 7 minutes and 51 seconds. And in, in the lull in between, you almost forgot how powerful the mix of everything really sounded at once. And then another guitar comes in playing octave chords, and you're just like, how could music be this good? And the mantle truly flows like one complete musical idea from track to track, whether it be that ambient ending of In the Shadow of Our Pale Companion gliding into the beginning of Odell, or whether it be things coming literally full circle on the song and the great cold death of the earth, which reintroduces the acoustic theme from the album opener. And then with the closing track, a desolation song, you feel like you're almost getting like an epilogue after and the great cold death of the earth ties everything together. It could not be a better send off to this album too, because it turns sadness, well, desolation into this almost like fun sounding little ditty. It's crazy how a desolation song is like technically so fucking depressing, like with lyrics like forget about useless fucking hope and love is the poison of life. But for some reason, it always leaves me walking away from this album with nothing but like a huge smile on my face. The Mantle is one of the few albums that I tell people you really gotta hear, even if you, you don't get it at first, which is perfectly okay. It's of course best for late night listens, for gray days, for any time where depression is a looming presence in your life that, that cannot be ignored. And The Mantle takes a bit of a different approach to sadness than a lot of other aggressive music does. It doesn't turn hurt into outward anger like nu metal famously did. It doesn't drown you in its sorrows like emo music or like depressive black metal. Rather, it romanticizes and embraces gloominess, loneliness, and, and longing by attaching it to gorgeous, sweeping soundscapes and not once making it feel like something you have to repress or ignore. This album just sits in its bleak outlook in an almost matter-of-fact way. Just, this is how the world is, or at least this is how I see it, and this is what that sounds like. And that's not a good or a bad thing. That's just my reality, and that's perfectly okay. It truly is an amazing, transcendent piece of work. And if you have not heard it, please do not listen to another fucking note of music until you have. As always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment, or shoot me a message so we can continue to talk music, and I'll see you guys soon.